therapies in critical care. Uh, my name is uh, Ronaldo Belomo. I'm the Director of Intensive Care Research at the Austin Hospital in Melbourne. And I am chairing this session with Professor Claudio Ronco, who is Director of the Department of Nephrology at San Bortolo Hospital in Vicenza, Italy. We have um, a group of experts who will be talking about their experience with the use of uh, hemoperfusion therapy. Very lucky to have uh, the expertise of Dr. Franz Schwamais from Germany, who is uh, an expert in this area and is the director or chief of the Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care from Austria. Uh, and then we will have a presentation from Dr. Vladimir uh, Cerny from the Czech Republic, who will be talking about adsorption therapy uh, at the bedside from concept to bedside. And then second after that, we will have a presentation from Professor Do, uh, who is speaking from Vietnam and his experience of the use of uh, the HA330 hemoperfusion cartridge in sepsis and pancreatitis. And after that, we will have a discussion uh, amongst uh, these experts and the chairs about multiple important aspects of this technology, which is emerging as more and more important in critical care. So we're very lucky to be able to do this today. And I might start now by um, asking the first speaker, uh, Professor Vladimir Cerny, uh, to begin his uh, presentation. Uh, Vladimir, over to you. Thank you. Hello. Good morning to all of you. Can you hear me? We can hear you and uh, we just you, need can to... You see my slides? Can you we see can. my slides? We can. Excellent. Okay. Good morning. It's a nine o'clock uh, in the Czech. And I hope nothing happens because outside of my house, there is a huge storm and a huge raining. So I hope my connection will last for all my presentation. The title of my talk is Adsorption Therapy on the way from the concept to the bedside. And I will be talking mainly about hemoperfusion therapy in a clinical setting. Uh, Speaking of any clinical intervention, I always like to start my talks with, I would say, gentle reminder that our clinical decision should be always based on a mixture of three basic ingredients or basic stones. The first one is, let's say, scientific evidence of the topic. The second one is understanding and deep knowledge of pathophysiology of the disease. And of course, and definitely last but not the least, it's our clinical experience, which sometimes drives our indication of various therapy and uh, modalities. So the learning objectives of my talk is the for the first is to review the concept of blood purification. The second uh, aim is to discuss current scientific evidence of the topic. And I cannot move now. And uh, I would like to leave this uh, talk with trying to answer the key question for us as a clinician. What is the real scientifically fair role of this therapeutic modality in our daily clinical practice? Uh, my topic, my lecture has four parts, the concept, the evidence, the gaps, and uh, at the end, I will try to summarize key points for us as a clinicians. Let me start with the concept. Basically, the story of hemoperfusion has started maybe more than 40 years ago, and the uh, hemoperfusion therapy is closely related to the evolution of CRRT technology. And the same rule applies for relation to evolution of sorbent materials that are uh, uh, used for this 
hemopurification therapy in our clinical practice. Uh, don't think this is chocolate. If you take a close look on the screen now, you can see that those uh, brown objects, those are resin beads creating absorbing materials in many hemopurificating cartridges nowadays, especially made by Jaffron company. To understand the concept, we need to understand many, many principles, many things. And one of the key important principles that we must understand, what is the mechanism of mass transport from the solution to the sorbent surface as fluid goes on the surface of absorbing material. We also need to understand key physical chemical mechanism that are regulating molecular surface uh, absorption on the absorbing material. And here you can see on this slide, the main characteristics of the absorption cartridges and the type of cartridge determines clinical use of this, of this uh, cartridges in clinical practice. Uh, to simplify the issue, what is the rationale behind blood purification? Basically, if we have a, at, at the start some insult leading to critical illness, this insult uh, commonly you know, induce inflammatory reaction, which sometimes may be exaggerated and is, it's leading to hyperinflammation. And this hyperinflammation would create organ damage. If we use a blood purification system of any kind, we may theoretically and practically as well, uh, let's say, reach less organ damage at the end of the day in those, in those uh, patients. To see this concept, let's say, in more sophistical way, here you can see nice picture from the paper uh, uh, written by Claudio Ronco, who is uh, today's uh, chair of our session. And here you can see in more details what is going on during, let's say, systemic cytokine release phase and how uh, uh, hemoperfusion or uh, hemopurification technology may affect uh, some key pathophysiological mechanism leading to organ dysfunction in our critical ill. Uh, patients. Uh, the question is if there is a sufficient evidence supporting the concept and the answer is quite clear, definitely yes. Uh, let me just show uh, two nice, maybe simple papers showing that blood purification can effectively improve high, high level or, or higher level of cytokines in the body. This is the, this is the paper uh, published uh, uh, one year ago showing nicely that uh, hemopurification significantly decrease uh, many cytokines playing role in this clinical condition. Very simple, but nice paper. Even uh, the, the study was done in Iran uh, showing what is going on if we implement blood purification techniques and uh, what is uh, their impact on a level of IL-6 and IL-8 and, IL and many other inflammatory uh, cytokines. Let's move to the second part of my talk and this is current scientific evidence. And uh, there are many clinical areas that have been covered by scientific evidence on the use of blood purification methods. And don't worry, I will not, I will not discuss in details none of them, but I will just, uh, I, I just made the list what condition uh, or diseases uh, have been covered by using this technology. And we can see liver disease, intoxication, thyroid storm, sepsis, septic shock, and multiple organ failure, uh, hyperinflammating status uh, after cardiopulmonary bypass, after cardio surgery, ARDS, and uh, during the last uh, one or two, two years, we have been uh, we have uh, we have seen uh, using this these modalities also in COVID nineteen patients uh, as well. Just uh, one simple, uh, let's say, technological uh, slide showing that the most often way of using 
uh, absorption therapy is combine this uh, technology together with uh, ongoing CRRT techniques in particular uh, patients. If we take a, a look on all, on all studies, what could be concluded from all those clinical studies? In terms of scientific methodology, we can see that there is a definitely limited number of patients who have been included in, the, in those studies. Most of those studies are case reports or observational trials. And uh, definitely there is a lack of robust randomized clinical trials that could help us to support uh, more our, uh, let's say, uh, our current view for using this technology in, uh, in broader way in our clinical practice. Uh, the common findings of all those studies are as follows. If measured, so we can clearly see decrease of inflammatory mediators or cytokines in all studies. We could see resolution or improvement of organ dysfunction or organ failure. Uh, in many, many of those studies I have mentioned, we can see shortening organ dysfunction and better final clinical outcome have been often described. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, many or majority of studies are, let's say, case reports and, non, and, and not uh, randomized clinical trials. Now let me move to uh, the gaps of a uh, whole today's topic. There are many, uh, many gaps. I, will, I would like to comment just a few of them. And uh, of course, we all know that there are areas of clinical uncertainty. Uh, the key questions we are dealing daily, uh, speaking of, let's say, in whom we should implement this therapy is who is the right patient, when to start this therapy, and for how long we should continue this treatment in our patient. And I will try to make some, let's say, uh, point, and those will be my personal point to those questions, questions that I have already raised in my previous slide in whom I would consider uh, hemopurification therapy in patients, uh, I would consider as a, let's say, organ modulating tool in patients who are on CRRT, who are presenting uh, as a clinical hyperinflammatory phenotype where, uh, let's say, whole clinical context suggests presence of cytokine storm and at the same time, patients' organ functions are getting worse and worse over time, despite we use standard measures as we know them from daily clinical practice. The key question is, of course, when to start. And I don't think we can have a, let's say, ultimate answer to this question. In my opinion, I would start this therapy as soon as possible if, I, if I'm sure that my patient belongs to the, uh, let's say, to the subpopulation of patient presenting as a hyperinflammatory phenotype uh, in ICU, I, ICU population. How long, again, is uh, another important question. And in my view, there are two key conditions which should be considered before we start to think about uh, terminating this therapy in our patient. The first one is the leading cause is or must be under control. Uh, for example, the, we should uh, remove source of infection. And I would like to see in my patient improving his or her organ function that uh, would last at least 24 hours without any, any let's say, uh, of, of exemptions. Let me finalize my talk, let's say, uh, with trying to answer the key question I raised uh, at the start of my talk. And what is the scientifically fair role of this therapeutic modality in our clinical practice? And uh, I think we can conclude based on current, let's say, uh, evidence, our uh, 
I mean, worldwide clinical experience that the, this technology, if it's used, it seems to be safe. There is uh, no, let's say, big harm to the patient, uh, uh, except for, of course, uh, harm, uh, let's say, that uh, uh, is coming from cannulation, et cetera, et cetera. And the second point which I would like to make is that current evidence does not allow to consider it's as uh, a standard. And for now, I would consider this therapy still as an experimental therapy. And uh, I'm sure that, that we all know that we should not expect that this approach would be, let's say, another ultimate magic ballot. On the other side, we have to be fair and uh, for, I, I call them pure EBM fighters. Absence of evidence does not mean evidence of absence. And I'm sure that before final position to, let's say, to uh, clinical relevance of the method can be made, we just need to use this technology, to, this method in order to get more data and to obtain more clinical experience. And uh, in my opinion, I'm sure that current clinical experience clearly say it's worth it. And I'm sure there is a, a huge uh, space for implementing this modality in selected ICU patients. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cerny. Uh, I appreciate the excellent presentation. Um, what we're gonna do next is to ask Professor Doe to give his presentation. And then after that, we will have a questions and answers and discussion. So let me invite uh, Professor Doe to take uh, over the screen and begin his presentation. Yeah, so thank you. So can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Yeah. That looks good. Okay, yeah. So uh, thank you very much for the uh, very important event and invitation. Uh, and I'm very happy to show uh, some uh, information and some experience from Vietnam. But we're working with uh, hemoperfusion uh, for sepsis and uh, acute pancreatitis by uh, uh, HA330 Catrick. So my talk uh, that we uh, be in the three uh, two uh, main topic. First, we talk about the uh, situation sepsis and acute pancreatitis in Vietnam, and second, we uh, just show a little bit about result of our study and some case study we using the HA three three zero Catrick in Vietnam. So sepsis is the main problem in Vietnam. Then uh, we're working in the uh, uh, ICU of uh, one biggest, uh, biggest ED in Vietnam, and we have very high prevalence of the sepsis, uh, and uh, it's a leading uh, admission to many medical and general ICU in Vietnam, up to thirty-two percent of cases with a very high mortality, uh, especially in case we have uh, multi-drug uh, resistant. Pathogen is one of a big, big problem for ICU in Vietnam. We have the mortality rate and going up to 80% in some case, and a very high cost for the antibiotic uh, and various uh, monitoring system and hemophilization and prolonged hospital stay and ICU stay and uh, many, many things else. For Q pancreatitis is another issue in Vietnam, and also we are facing with Many patients coming to ICU with the uh, uh, problem with up, uh, alcohol problem, uh, and that's causing a lot of uh, acute pancreatitis. And with the very high morbidity and mortality, in some cases, uh, uh, with the prolonged uh, complication, up to 40% of cases and mortality going up to 20% cases. So it's, it's, it's a two big problem, uh, both uh, sepsis and uh, Pancreatitis is a high burden for family and society, and it's very high cost, up to uh, fifty thousand US dollars. And you see that Vietnam is a very poor country; it's cost sometimes a very huge fortune for one family in Vietnam. So there are the two two same uh, uh, the two different uh, issue, but uh, share the same thing. It uh, causing the uh, uh, cytokine storm, and I very appreciate. Uh, 
the talk from Professor Vladimir to, to mention about this type of storm in which we need to use of uh, hemoperfusion for the patient as a supporting uh, treatment. Uh, we uh, have uh, done several studies, and uh, this is one of the past studies we do, we're doing in the septic shock patient. And uh, uh, this is uh, mainly we based on the sepsis three definition to choose for the patient we come to our uh, ICU. And we show that, uh, we, can, we could show that uh, we can reduce the uh, vaso pressure requirement in case we use the HA3T0 catrick. Uh, with uh, we compare between the uh, on admission 24 hour, 48 hour, and 72 hour, uh, and also we can show that uh, the requirement for the suppressor in the uh, in uh, with the, especially for um, you know not only not only but also to put them on so decreasing over time. And uh, the other uh, parameter we want to, to see that uh, whether the, uh, the HA3T0 is working for the reduction of the uh, cytokines and in Vietnam we cannot do many uh, cytokines, we can do only interleukin-6 uh, and uh, we see that uh, dramatically a reduction of interleukin-6 in the patient we, uh, between the, the before and after uh, absorption therapy, uh, and you see that uh, significantly reduction. Then another study we uh, did on the Q pancreatitis patient, and this one we choose the patient based on the uh, clinical symptoms, uh, X-ray, uh, CT scan of abdominal scan, and cytokine level of uh, 1,000 uh, picogram per liter and above. And we could show that uh, the reduction of uh, uh, the, the improvement of the symptoms of, of the patient and uh, especially improvement of the uh, blood pressure, the urine output, creatinine level and lactate level during the treatment. And uh, we just saw several cases in here that this is the first case. Uh, this uh, case is uh, very typical for the septic patient. We treated our ICU. This is 48 male, uh, so they get uh, admitted to the hospital uh, because of the fevers and uh, low blood pressure, high rate uh, blood rate, and uh, the, uh, they, ask, uh, they 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 uh, make a diagnosis in the uh, local hospital. The patient have liver abscess. And because of the, the, a lot of uh, problems, so that they have to refer the patient to our hospital. And this patient is an alcoholic. And on uh, admission, the patient in the septic shock uh, uh, condition with very low blood pressure, and also the patients are on the uh, noradrenaline and uh, dubutamine with a high dose. And uh, the symptoms uh, we so far, this patient have some symptom, uh, abdominal uh, symptoms. Uh, and the third test to, to show that the patient is uh, very uh, uh, septic and uh, also the IC score very high. And when we measure the interleukin sick levels, it's uh, uh, very high uh, in this uh, patient. And we do the culture of the abdomen uh, fluid and we found that the patient have a pseudomalase uh, infection. And this is where some of the, the one of the kind of infection very difficult to treat in Vietnam because of resistance to many antibiotics. And uh, this patient, we uh, uh, put uh, the patient in the our ICU and we put the patient in the high dose of norepinephrine. And because of very high uh, demand for the laser pressure, so we decided to intubate and um, mechanically ventilate the patient. And we uh, put the patient on CVH with the absorption therapy by HA330 Catrick. And uh, for from day uh, two and to day five, the patient improving dramatically and we can win the patient in day 10 and activate the patient. So this level of the interleukin sick uh, going down from the from more than 5,000, actually that is the cutoff in which you cannot matter higher than 5,000. And we uh, can see that it's a reduction 
after the first and second and the third uh, episode of hemoperfusion, uh, uh, and we see the PCT level also going down accordingly. So for facial pressure requirement, we see the reduction in the uh, norepinephrine and glutamine uh, before and after the uh, treatment. The second case I just want to show here is with the case of acute pancreatitis. This is a quite young man. Uh, it's usually a uh, case in Vietnam with a young, uh, young man with uh, alcoholism. And the patient have history of acute pancreatitis seven months earlier, and he's a chronic alcoholism. And on only one day uh, before admission, the patient had a sharp pain and uh, in, on the epigastric region uh, and the way to local hospital and then transferred to our hospital. So the patient on admission, the patient's alert, low fever, and the patient had blood pressure is okay, but a little bit uh, stuck uh, keep near and uh, oxygen, the, the need to put on oxygen on the patient. And the patient with the, uh, on a P examination, we see that the uh, abdomen of the full distension tenderness and uh, the pain on the epigastric region. Uh, for the lab results, we, uh, we see that the patient is uh, acidosis and with a very high levels of uh, amylase and uh, uh, triglycerides. Uh, and uh, we do the CAT scan and show that the patient has hepatic pancreatitis. And uh, the SOFA score 11 is quite uh, very common, severe acute pancreatitis. So we, uh, we, we call that, so we, we see this is a change in we, when we decided to do the uh, hemoperfusion therapy and we see, we see the changes uh, of the abdomen pressure uh, during that uh, uh, the therapy. And uh, we also monitor the, uh, uh, the data of fluids from the abdomen and uh, et cetera. Uh, for the uh, uh, changes in the interleukin sick, we see that uh, dramatically uh, reduction of the levels of interleukin sick uh, uh, bef before and after the uh, treatment. And uh, we did uh, three times of the treatment and it's going down very dramatically. And the patient can improve uh, later on. And uh, it's a very successful case. Another problem we uh, uh, all the way uh, focused in the whether the absorption therapy causing complications such as uh, uh, low blood blood lead. Uh, so we monitor very closely and see that in the uh, first, second, and third days we see the uh, reduction of blood lead, and uh, later on uh, it it uh, improve uh, simultaneously after that. So uh, in conclusions, uh, I think sepsis and acute pancreatitis is the most common cause of ICU admission in Vietnam. And uh, treatment for these uh, uh, problems is uh, difficult and costly for our healthcare system and for the family. And hemoperfusion is, uh, have shown a promising option for the patient. And that is uh, very effective to reduce level of the cytokines uh, however, the outcomes it uh, need to be uh, studied more in a more randomized study. Uh, so I agree with uh, uh, Professor Vladimir that we need to choose the right patient, right protocol, and right timing uh, for the success of the treatment. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Do. That was a, an excellent presentation and uh, very interesting case discussion. Uh, so we're now in a position to begin a discussion of some of the issues that have been raised in association with these presentations. And I will pass the chair to Professor Ronko uh, to begin this discussion. Professor Ronko. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Belomo, and thanks uh, to the speakers, uh, in particular when uh, Professor Cerny has presented uh, his talk. Uh, 
I, I thought uh, uh, it, it was me speaking because he was so much uh, uh, in agreement uh, with uh, what I always uh, uh, proposed in terms of uh, utilizing the technique to get more data rather than killing the technique because we have no data. So this is a propositive and positive attitude that uh, we should learn in order to know more what are the potentials of this uh, incredible uh, uh, therapy. Now, uh, we have the opportunity to uh, discuss some of the aspects uh, that uh, I think are crucial. And uh, one of these is when, when to start this uh, therapy, which is also linked to the idea of what are the precise indications. Um, in general, we may say, what is, uh, which one is the right patient and which one is the right time? So what are the conditions in which the specific patient uh, may really benefit? And the question that I pose to the, to the speaker is, uh, do we have uh, a specific profile of a patient to start with this therapy? And I would like to ask uh, first to Professor Cerny. Uh, thank you for a uh, tough question. To me, it's a discussion about what is, let's say, right clinical phenotype of the patient where we should implement this way of therapy. To me, uh, I can see uh, your question as a, let's say, description of some features of the patient. In my opinion, uh, I would implement this therapy in patient who is febrile, hyperfebrile, or pyretic, who is under CRRT for other condition, who is on a large dose of catecholamines that are not going down and whose clinical condition is getting worse and worse over time. That would be, in my opinion, so-called typical clinical phenotype of the patient where I would start to think about using this therapy. But uh, uh, Vladimir, um just to get a little bit in more in depth of this concept. Do you see therefore this therapy only as a rescue therapy from uh, a already established uh, uh, organ dysfunction and multiple organ uh, uh, dysfunction? Or do you see also as a possibility for prevention and protection of organ damage? Uh, this is another good question, but uh, to be honest, I don't know. I'm sure that in some patients, this preventive concept could work, definitely. But the question is how to define the right patient for so-called preventive treatment. And to this question, I don't have an answer. But I'm sure that some patients may definitely benefit from this preventive usage of the hemopurification therapy. But uh, I cannot describe precisely how such a patient should look like. Professor Do, uh, do you have ideas about what we discussed so far? So when to begin? in which patient, in which moment of his uh, stay in the ICU, and eventually for which purpose? Yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, I think this is a very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, we first, uh, uh, we try to use in the septic uh, shock patient and we are based on the SOFA score. And uh, for a long time, we based on SOFA score of nine and above, but uh, later on we see that it's too late for the patient. So we're moving uh, up this uh, SOFA score to uh, sick so, and uh, above. Uh, and now we see that still that is a challenge because if we do that in some case, 
especially when we, we do observation in the COVID-19 patient. We see if we even do it earlier and uh, with the symptoms, uh, the, the, more, the, the patient shows symptoms of uh, inf uh, systemic inflammatory uh, uh, process and we want to using uh, uh, the guy of uh, hemoperfusion to prevent the, 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 the failures of the organs. So that is very important for us because we need to do some some kind of prevention because we know that uh, out there the cyto cytokine storm is a uh, phenomenon. It's uh, causing the uh, damage to the uh, uh, organs. So we need to do, do the more advanced. And now we try uh, in more early uh, in the patient with uh, sepsis and not uh, wait until they they go to septic shock. So we just uh, in the first. Uh, kind of uh, uh, period in which we're moving from the kind of treatment to prevention for cytokine storm. Uh, I see uh, Professor Franz Fuames uh, from Baden near Vienna that uh, has joined us in this uh, nice uh, uh, webinar and I would love to uh, take advantage of his presence to hear about uh, what he thinks about this question. Um, <clears throat> we do not have the patients at the intensive care in a very early state. We get the patients on day two or three when uh, they are in a developed septic shock. And then uh, we use the, uh, the treatment as soon as possible. We start very, very uh, early uh, if we cannot get a resolution of the septic shock. If... Uh, Despite of adequate treatment, there is no uh, resolution of the septic shock and then we start the treatment. But uh, as a preventive measure, we would need the patient uh, much more earlier and we do not get it from the ward. So, uh, assuming we have these uh, options, what do you think are the, the main targets of our treatment? So uh, if you had to consider to propose endpoints for a study, for example, what kind of endpoints would you propose? Because we have already seen in many cases that using mortality as an endpoint may not be adequate to describe the effect of a therapy, which is intended to be uh, uh, applied for two, three days in the whole history of sepsis and ICU stay. So anybody want to comment on uh, uh, endpoints, which can be biochemical or physiological? Uh, if I may start, uh, I think it should be physiological endpoints because uh, all the markers we have are not uh, good enough to, to describe the situation. You have IL-6 and I do not think that IL-6 is a good entry criterion because we have people with IL-6 with 65,000 with urosepsis and we do not need hemoabsorption therapy to uh, resolve the problems. And we have people with 700 IL-6 and they need hemoabsorption therapy. PCT is bound to the membrane. If you do not get a lowering of, of PCT, you have to check your antibiotic strategy and so on. Uh, so I think uh, resolution of septic shock to get rid of vasopressors is the main, the main point uh, that we should uh, aim to. Vlad? Uh, currently, there is an ongoing discussion in the Czech uh, how to define endpoints for uh, national observational study uh, to use this, this uh, concept. And uh, the ongoing discussion has not been ended yet, but there is a clear agreement that it should be physical, uh, physiological or clinical endpoint. No laboratory endpoint at all. Yes. yes. Th this is interesting because uh, I can confirm that uh, uh, we can clearly demonstrate in vitro 
the uh, removal of cytokines uh, and uh, reduction of cytokines. But uh, we have now seen uh, a very uh, different kinetics of uh, cytokines uh, from uh, different uh, batches of blood uh, showing that activation by LPS, for example, can be very different. Uh, and therefore, since we don't know the generation, we don't know the volume of distribution, we are a little bit uh, uh, blocked in uh, defining efficiency uh, in terms of uh, biochemical parameters. While uh, physiological parameters used as endpoints may uh, represent uh, the meaning of the therapy, the result of the therapy. Uh, maybe, Rinaldo, you want to comment on this, right? Look, I, th I think that's always been one of the difficulties of blood purification technology that uh, affected the beginning of continuous renal replacement therapy and the application of hemofiltration to the treatment of sepsis. And it's been a recurrent issue that biological signals such as cytokines or chemokines or other molecules that are expressed by the immune system in response to infection do not have a predictable relationship with the clinical manifestations of disease. And because of that, most clinicians, as Vladimir was pointing out, uh, and, and everyone in clinical practice would agree, uh, are treating the patient, not, not the numbers, not the biology, because we don't really understand it. And so I agree with all of my colleagues and yourself that future studies of this technology should be directed towards demonstrating in controlled randomized trials that the physiological variables that we use to indicate resolution or attenuation of organ dysfunction have been affected by this intervention in a way that is superior to our current therapy. Uh, Rinaldo, one more little question. So uh, you are talking about uh, resolution or attenuation. In other words, uh, our strategy is towards uh, either resolve a clinical picture or mitigate the effect of the uh, uh, derangement. And uh, you know, the new definition of sepsis is a disruption of the immune system response. So again, I ask you what I asked uh, before. Uh, would you be seeing this therapy more as a rescue therapy or, or a potentially protective therapy? Uh, I think there is a moderate position. I think as a rescue therapy, it has obviously some potential in some patients. Uh, but I think once you're in a very difficult situation, the ability of any therapy to uh, return you back to a high likelihood of survival and recovery from organ dysfunction is diminished. So there is a middle ground where the patient is neither too uh, overwhelmingly ill nor insufficiently ill to justify this kind of therapy. And I think you know, that can be defined by organ failure. It might be defined by a combination of markers such as the organ failure itself, the degree of vasopressor support, uh, the degree of uh, renal dysfunction in people with disseminated intravascular coagulation, the degree of activation of coagulation. There'll be different ways of potentially identifying patients in the middle ground. But I think if we do trials, where we only use it as rescue in people that are extremely ill, we will be disappointed. I think if you do trials, as Franz was mentioning, or people with a high interleukin that have got a urinary tract infection, we will be disappointed because those patients will do well anyway. And so the target is a population in the mid zone, uh, which we can define, but those are the patients most likely to start showing uh, statistically significant effects compared to control populations.
what Professor Belomo has just mentioned is a, a biological phenomenon which is common to several types of interventions. If you select a, a too sick population, uh, they might die anyway. If you select a, a very, let's say, little sick population, they may survive anyway. So the chance to see the difference uh, that your intervention makes uh, is exactly in the intermediate uncertain area where indeed you have the chance to improve. On the other hand, many of these blood purification therapies and intervention have shown that they are likely to be successful in patients where the control group has a high mortality. Because uh, if the control group has a low mortality, the chance to further improve uh, survival is, uh, is quite limited. Professor Do, what is your idea? Yeah, I totally agree with you that in case that we uh, choose the patient, uh, we need to choose the right patient. So that's sometimes a problem for us because we are tertiary center. So the people refer to us uh, and already in the late state and we cannot do many things to that patient. And sometimes it's, uh, uh, we just order something to do to improve the patient and sometimes making uh, the family feel a little bit uh, comfortable with uh, they have the best treatment in the best hospital. However, we need to do that uh, to, to choose the, the right patient. And I think that for right patient, we just uh, about 25% of our patient in our facility. So that is a big problem for us that uh, sometimes we need to make a very uh, quick decision at the beginning when the patient admit to our hospital. We need to decide what is good for the, uh, the patient, what is the uh, treatment, uh, best treatment for that patient. That, that is a, sometimes our problem. The, the, to close this part of the discussion, I would like to ask you, uh, in intensive care, because uh, someone mentioned before that uh, treatment should be started in patients already ongoing on CRT. What about uh, a patient that is not uh, on CRT? What could be the risk or the drawbacks to apply this therapy in a patient that uh, is not on CRT? <coughs> Okay. Um, nearly every patient of our patients has a renal problem. So uh, we use as a basic system uh, a continuous renal replacement therapy system and not the hemopair fusion system. There are several points. All of our stuff is very familiar with uh, continuous renal replacement therapy. We do not have a hemoperfusion machine and I would not uh, see that there is a need for a hemoperfusion uh, machine because we could not uh, use our, our um, anticoagulation, our side thread anticoagulation. It's very hard to use it with a hemoperfusion machine. So there are uh, many points that, uh, that are not in favor of a hemoperfusion, uh, but for a renal replacement therapy system that everybody knows and uses it every day. Franz, uh, uh, I, I think uh, I can read the mind of Professor Bellomo because he <laughs> certainly remembers at the early stages of uh, CRRT, CAVH, CVVH, when this was considered uh, a extraordinary therapy and many mm -hmm. people were questioning whether we should start, we should not start uh, the risk and so on. And today uh, I, you candidly admitted that uh, this is very well known and very routine therapy and to put hemoperfusion on top of it is just simple a little step. So Rinaldo, <laughs> do you want to comment on this? Yeah, I think the therapies have evolved and I think France has a very good comment in terms of the technology that's readily available and that people are familiar with. It's very easy to set up a circuit and add a hemofilter in series. 
Uh, I think that if you're going to create a circuit in somebody who's sick enough to require hemoperfusion, most of the time they would have a degree of renal dysfunction. So uh, I think that's you know, easy to put everything in series and the nursing staff are trained to that. And as Franz pointed out, if you're doing citrate anticoagulation, which is beneficial in terms of persisting uh, for a good filter life, uh, as well as a good uh, hemoperfusion device life, uh, all of that is combined in one intervention that the team are familiar with, and I think that's desirable, which, which takes me up to another question which people have raised in relation to hemoperfusion, and that is the duration of the cartridge life. And I'd be very interested in the views of Dr. Vladimir and uh, Franz and Dr. Doe. What do they think is an acceptable or optimal duration of utilization of a single cartridge? <clears throat> Two hours, four hours, eight hours? What do you think? Our cartridges uh, with citrate anticoagulation and under this uh, described uh, pre uh, preconditions uh, run, would run, I think, 72 hours, but uh, they are saturated after, I think, 15 to 16 hours. So we changed the first cartridge depending on the symptoms of the patient and the resolution of the shock. Uh, after eight to 10 hours, the second cartridge after 16 hours and the third cartridge and we use three cartridges uh, after 24 hours and there are no problems with the cartridges. Um, you can uh, change the whole uh, CRT system or you can, um, depending on the condition of the CRT system, you can uh, run the same system for three cartridges. So, Franz, you, you place the cartridge before the CRT filter? No, we have uh, okay. the Dexter Gambro machines and they have, uh, we have to place it after the CRT right. filter. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, excellent. That's, uh, yeah. you know, the, uh, after, placing it after also is, is, if you're doing citrate anticoagulation, yeah. then you've got the citrate running in the pre-filter position yeah. and then yeah. the... Uh, ionized calcium of the post-filter blood, which then would go into the cartridge. I've got somebody being treated at the moment with carbamazepine, a uh, life-threatening overdose. Then mm -hmm. you've got the ionized calcium going into the cartridge at you know, 0 0.35, 0 0.4, and that allows yeah. you to preserve the cartridge life without any major difficulty. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, uh, your, uh, let's say, uh, rational of uh, what you said is that uh, saturation of the cartridge occurs earlier when you have higher concentration of solutes that you want to remove, while when you lower the concentration, saturation may occur uh, uh, slowly and the uh, duration of the cartridge is longer. Vlad, you wanted to comment? Going back to your question, uh, if I use this therapy in my patient, I would leave the cartridge as long as possible, uh, even, uh, even 72 hours. And if uh, the cartridge gets obstructed, uh, I would wait and I would, uh, let's say, uh, I would take a look on the patient's condition. If he saw her condition, improved a lot, I would not go on if there would not be, uh, let's say, significant improvement, I would go on. Uh, so uh, just to, to tell uh, all the audience, we are talking about uh, 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 duration of a single device. We're talking about duration of the therapy or frequency of application, et cetera. My impression is that so far, uh, in many cases, we have underdosed the uh, absorption therapy. And in the future, we will probably go for a more 
uh, continuous and intensive therapy in the right moment. Professor Do? Yeah, I, I think so. I agree with you that we can uh, uh, prolong the, the treatment for hemoperfusion. Uh, but at this moment, we try uh, on our patient based on recommend from the manufacturer. The other issue is uh, we, we worry about that maybe uh, because of uh, absorption therapy and it causing the uh, thrombocytopenia and uh, et cetera, something like that. So that's why uh, we choose to some kind of safety option that we follow the manufacturer uh, recommendation. Um. We will certainly probably come up uh, with a better indication and recommendation uh, also to the producer when more experiments and more studies will be done on the isotherms for different, uh, for different uh, uh, solutes. In particular, we have done some studies on antibiotics and uh, we have seen a significant amount of absorption of uh, vancomycin, for example, or other uh, antibiotics. Uh, uh, how would you suggest to manage antibiotic therapy in these conditions? Uh, there are several studies. Uh, I remember some this line is elite and this uh, hemorrhons, and they overcome the situation to give an additional dose or to prime the system. Uh, because the absorption of antibiotics uh, takes place in, the, in a very early phase of the use of the cartridge. So um, we give an additional dose of linozolate. We give uh, three, uh, three times 600 milligrams, but uh, um, we should measure it. Others? Which yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I will wait. Okay, uh, with regard to antibiotics, I'm, I think it, it's imperative to measure antibiotics level during therapy. Otherwise, you don't know what you are doing in your patient with, with regard to antibiotics. Uh, let me just make one point uh, and going back to uh, Claudio's question about duration. I think the duration and the frequency of uh, changing uh, cartridges depends what concept uh, we one I use in our patient, whether preventive or rescue, because uh, we have to distinguish if it's so-called preventive of uh, my thinking about duration and changing cartridges would be definitely different compared to a rescue approach of using this therapy. Thanks. Though I have come in for the antibiotic and uh, we yeah, are sure that uh, we uh, think that absorption can absorb a lot of antibiotics. So that's why uh, our uh, recommendation for our team that is we uh, need to uh, rescale the dose of the antibiotic. For example, we can make the dose after the therapy because we do sh short uh, therapy about four hours and we start the antibiotic uh, after that. And for something we do continuous uh, 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 antibiotic uh, uh, treatment like uh, vancomycin, we uh, uh, monitor the, uh, the, the concentration uh, more closely. And uh, that's, that's the only one way that this is moment I, uh, we can do in our patient uh, in Vietnam. And, and, and I can comment that uh, studying the application of the cartridge for a longer duration we have not seen variations of the pressure profile in the circuit showing that if you provide an adequate anticoagulation, it's very unlikely that the resistance uh, to flow inside the cartridge would uh, increase significantly. We have also made uh, studies on flow distribution and because of the packing density is not so high, the possibility to have a, a free flowing tendency with no increase in pressure drop due to the uh, cartridge is, uh, uh, is uh, quite normal. 
Um, Rinaldo, I think we are getting close to the end of the session. I would like to ask you maybe to, to make some uh, key remarks. Yes, that would be very good. So we've been very lucky to have uh, three very experienced clinicians who have done quite a lot of work with the adsorptive technology of the H330. Uh, Professor Doe, Professor Schwammheis and Professor Vladimir Czerny. And I think they've provided us with a lot of experience and evidence. And it's been really good to have a discussion about several key aspects of this therapy. This is a new therapy that we're beginning to understand more clearly. And it's clear that there are lots of questions that remain uh, to be addressed as we gain more experience. There is a lot of interest, I think, in doing this therapy perhaps earlier. There is a lot of interest in doing this therapy for longer. There is a greater understanding about what it can do. There is also an understanding that antibiotics may be affected and therefore adjustment of the dosage and monitoring of antibiotics is really important. And there is also a clear understanding that future investigations and future trials of this therapy would have to be focused on physiological outcome measures before biological outcome measures, which we still can't understand. I would like to close this uh, seminar by thanking all the speakers who've been kind enough to give of their time to give their presentations and their expertise. And I'm sure it's been very useful for the audience. So thank you very much to everyone. And we look forward to further discussions in the future. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.